Hi, everyone. Welcome to our executive talk on helping remote workforces stay connected. My name is Paul Chapman. I'm the CIO at Box. Today, I'm joined by Anisha Viswani, who's the corporate CIO at Box, Stephen Franchetti, who's the VP of Business Technology at Slack, Hector Aguilar, who is the president of technology at Okta, and Gary Sorrentino, who is the CIO advisor at Zoom. Thanks for joining me, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks us. Good to be here. So these are unprecedented times uh, in the world today as we come to grips with you know, grasping this, this new reality. Um, remote work is suddenly an overnight requirement and you know, very few organizations, I think, generally were feeling prepared. You know, I, I've been sort of jesting a little bit, but it feels like we're being forced into the, the world's largest work from home experiment. Um, and so far, it hasn't been easy for a lot of companies. Um, and, in, and for some, unfortunately, it's also a wake up call for organizations that may have placed you know, too much focus on daily operational needs at the expense of maybe investing in you know, a digital business architecture or a modern reference architecture um, and, and some of the long term resiliency plans. So, so today, you know, we're going to spend some time digging into what we know is top of mind for every technology leader right now. And that's how are we helping our remote workforces stay connected? Uh, so I'll start sort of, I'll start with sort of each of our respective companies here. You know, it's, it's, it's clear the business landscape is facing unprecedented set of challenges, um, which is fueling a lot of change in how we think about technology and remote work. And certainly any service that involves uh, communication exchange is seeing a significant increase in, in, in usage. So as technology leaders of companies whose services are in increased demand, um, what are some of the steps each of your companies is taking to support the reliability and scalability of, 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 your, of your platforms? So maybe Gary, we'll start with Zoom because I certainly know Zoom, uh, demand for Zoom services has significantly gone up in, in the last few weeks here. Yeah, so capacity means a lot of things, right? We're, we're looking at the way that people are, are logging in. We're looking at time zones. Uh, we're trying to offset data centers depending on east to west and west to east, but also looking at how we're staffing the help desk and how we're staffing and how we support people, um, our own staff uh, around the globe. So I think it's, it's a combination of, yes, of course, the technology was always set up to handle more load and we continue to do that, but it's all the things that are around it. Um, you know, it makes no sense if it's up, but you can't support people. So uh, I think it's to provide that, that service when, when uh, volume surge is not just about the technology, but also thinking about support, um, the third parties that we work with, you know, to send mails and things like that, the many, many applications that we connect to, uh, they all, they're part of the ecosystem and they all need to be at the same way. So I think it's a, it's a joint effort across the firm to make sure that, of course, the Zoom platform stays standing, but all the support organizations around it uh, do the same. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Stephen, what about over at Slack? Yeah, no, we, we've seen certainly a, a kind of massive explosion in the, the usage of Slack really over the past couple of weeks. Um, and it's, you know, it's indiscriminate when, when it looks at the, the different types of customers, whether they're large customers or, or smaller organizations. So we've seen about 2 million of an increase in connected users um, over the last couple of weeks, which is phenomenal uh, when you think about that. So it's, it's definitely uh, it's put a wrench in the works when it comes to any of the, the, the normal road mapping plans that we had in place. Um, we've really had to turn our attention to how do we ensure that we're supporting the customer appropriately as job number one. Um, but our first concern to do that is, is of course with our employees and making sure that they're in a good place so that they can in turn effectively support our, our customers. And the way we've approached it internally is, is really in this order, it's been take care of yourselves, take care of your families, and then ultimately take care of the work. And, and when you're working, bring your full attention to it. And if you need to take additional time off during the day, then that's totally understandable given that you might have three kids at home and you're trying to share the kitchen table with your spouse doing video conferencing. And it's a really tough situation to be in. Uh, I know this from my own personal experience of having made the transition. Um, but really, in addition to that, it's not just about the, the technical aspects of business continuity. It's really about how do you set your people up for success such that they can support the customer effectively. Yeah, very interesting. And that, we're going to have, uh, we're going to dive in a little bit on some of the, the cultural challenges and cultural uh, considerations that are now, that we're now having to go through. To your point, technology is, a, is, a, is an enabler to enable people to work from anywhere. 
Um, but then is the culture attuned, your organizational culture attuned to working in that, uh, in that style? Uh, uh, Hector, what about uh, what's going on at Okta? You know, it's actually pretty interesting because um, one of the things that we're seeing is that because a lot of people are working from home now, typically people will create uh, multi-factor authentication policies um, that do not apply when they are in the corporate office. So now that everybody's um, working from home, we're actually seeing a huge increase in multi-factor authentication requests. So that's kind of one piece that we're seeing. I think in the last 20 days, we grew like 30% in terms of like people trying to um, authenticate using MFA. Um, so that's good because we're trying to keep kind of the, the bad guys um, out um, of the corporate resources. But another interesting thing that um, we kind of thought that we were gonna see an increase, but we didn't see, we didn't think that it was gonna be so massive is SMS. You know, one of the things that you can do with Okta is to use mm. um, SMS or voice factor to get your MFA. We're seeing a huge increase in that because there's a lot of people mm. that um, just decide to use SMS for this. And right now we're actually seeing from the carriers that even globally, the carriers are having a problem because a lot of people are using more phones. A lot of, you, a lot of people are using more SMSs. So things are actually getting saturated. So we have been doing a couple of things. One is working with our providers, obviously to make sure that we know that the SMSs um, are arriving to, to the to end user but also monitoring, you know, and I'm sure like a lot of uh, Zoom, Slack, um, Box, and, and, and ourselves, and, and, and Okta as well, we're actually increasing a lot of the monitoring that we're doing into the service, just to make sure that we have the right capacity, just to make sure yeah. that we are kind of like trying to get ahead of, of what, what, what is happening. Um, and so we're seeing great data and, and, um, and a lot of usage of our, of our platform, and especially in the Yeah, yeah, fascinating. And I know we'll touch on some of the security and risk aspects that we've seen to it, that we've that have emerged from various other conversations that we've had. It'd be be good to get your uh, your perspective on that as well, Anisha. Yeah. So with Box, I mean, you know, our mission is to power how the world works together uh, in good times, but we certainly take it very seriously in times like this where we know customers are relying on us. So from a Box perspective, you know, the, the product and operations teams have been hyper focused on making sure the system and the service continues to be available and reliable. The other interesting thing I think we see is in times like this, unfortunately, in chaotic times, you see a lot of uh, bad actors um, spin up and, and try and take advantage of the situation. So we're also making sure our customers are aware of some of the uh, security capabilities we have in the product that can really help secure uh, some of their content, some of their most uh, critical content. And then I think um, thirdly, you know, we want to take away the friction of uh, from the users who are trying to figure out how to use Box to now suddenly uh, support 100% remote workforce. And so uh, we've taken away friction in terms of overages and, and, you know, having to deploy seats so that people are just able to get their work done uh, in this environment. And uh, so we're hyper focused on just supporting our customers and making sure they're successful as they transition very rapidly in some cases to having to support a completely remote workforce. Yeah, and I think that that's certainly something that uh, when you say rapidly or quickly, I remember just just three weeks ago, I was having conversations with uh, with some other technology leaders, and we were talking about what looked like this sort of creeping up on us working from home that we might have to do for a particular office or something. You could just sort of see it was creeping that way. And we were doing A-B testing on our network operations center, our security incident response center. Um, we even, we even uh, made the suggestion that maybe one day the following week, we would close down an office and see what would happen when everybody worked from home, how we would function and, and, and be productive. And I think literally within 96 hours of that, We'd shut down our London office, we'd shut down our Japan office, we'd shut down our New York office, and then 24 hours after that, we'd shut down our, our main headquarters. And so it, it went from being proactive to reactive. And I know many other companies that were, were working on making sure they had capacity. I, I've spoken to a number of customers that are, are companies that they may have had a remote work policy in place for a subset or ad hoc um, set of employees. So they might be a 5,000 5, person company and they had maybe capacity to handle 500 people working remotely and overnight they had to go to 5,000 people working remotely. So I'm, I'm you know, at Box and I'm sure, you know, it, it, in, similar to your companies, you know, we're all sort of born in the cloud growing up yeah. digital companies. So we have a, a, a sort of modern architecture that allows our services to be almost a work from anywhere, any place, any time. Um, but have you been, have you been spending time with, with 
with customers and other technology leaders, and, and maybe in, in you know we we have different blind spots inside our own organizations. What have, what considerations for enabling remote work quickly? You know, what have you learned as far as how well prepared you were, and maybe how well you've you've prepared some companies that you've been talking to were. Maybe Stephen, you want to. If you don't mind, I'll just jump in. Zoom. So at Zoom, yeah, we, mostly, right, right. we mostly worked from home. So from us, it was it was kind of easier because we had the platform and, and to send people home um, was a little bit easier because traditionally a lot of people work from home all the time. Uh, but to that point, we've been talking to people for the last six or eight months about that new virtual worker and how to make the new uh, millennials and Gen Zs happy at work. And a lot of that was they want to work from anywhere at any time and be productive. And then overnight, they're working from anywhere, anytime, and they're being productive. And so that, that whole culture got thrown upon us as we were trying to meet this demographics maybe halfway. And you're absolutely right what you said. Most companies we saw, they're prepared for what I call remote access. That is Sunday night, everybody's doing mail, right? Monday morning, I got to come in late because the kid needs to, I need to go to school or something like that. Maybe take a, you know, a semi-sick day home or something like that or work from home. All of a sudden, we went from that work from home community to those virtual workers where 100% of what they do has to be done from home. And uh, we've been working with companies just all over the world on how to support that. There is no one at the office to call up and say, hey, I'm home. Can you print this for me? Right? No, I'm home. I need to figure out how to do that. And so that, that whole trying to figure out where the new culture was going, this is a great test for the new culture. Yeah, yeah. Stephen, what, what about uh, what about over at Slack? You know, one of the things, you know, we're, we're sort of, I guess, in some ways, we're a little insulated from some of the complexities that manufacturing and physical supply chain companies have. But I've been talking to a lot of those companies and getting a lot of different feedback. But we are finding um, that even in, in, in organizations like ours, where you, you know, you, the virtual supply chain still has, still has, can have some weakness in it. I mean, we just, uh, we uncovered that one of our third party offshore providers that does a certain set of business services for us, mm -hmm. um, they work in a, what we call a clean room environment. And mm -hmm. that's a very controlled workspace. And it, when that environment closes down, it's not a case of just working from home because the, the clean room environment that they work in today or clean office environment they work in today breaks and that create that could potentially create risk or security challenges for us so having to think through that has been something that kind of caught us a little bit by surprise we hadn't thought through all of the sort of partners and sort of sub processors and things like that is there anything Stephen, you're running into over there on your side yeah i mean i suppose it's, it's good news and, and there's certainly a set of challenges i think i think the sheer velocity that we were all thrown into this took us all by surprise and i know you were telling your story about box we had a similar story at slack where um, we were planning for something like this but and you never really know what it's going to be like until you step into yeah. it um, and, and this one hit really really fast so it's certainly unprecedented I think the first consideration to your to your 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 earlier thought is is reducing the, the friction for employees is, is number one as we transition to working remotely and as, as much as possible make their experience as consistent as possible regardless of where they work from whether they're working from the corporate office or working from home or even on their mobile device for that matter and so our, our philosophy really focuses on as you called it that modern architecture we have very much a cafe or sort of zero trust model in place with our architecture so you don't have to log on to a vpn to get into the corporate network to access the tools you need and we're seeing more you know companies move away from the sort of traditional firewalled off networks which create a lot of friction for remote workers clearly um, and then it's about the systems and technologies that you choose to, to run your business and of course for us we're choosing SaaS partners like Zoom, Okta, and Box that provide that seamless experience regardless of where you're using the service from. So with that, it's kind of the sort of central design principle. I mean, clearly there, there's other challenges outside of that. The actual shift from to working at home has been relatively smooth for our employees. But we, you talked about some of the supply chain issues. Laptops is the classic one, um, de delivering laptops depending on where you are in the world. Uh, potential supply chain issues and logistics issues associated with that. So we've certainly seen some of that. Um, and certainly with our customers, if you're, if you're a company that's been heavily reliant on perhaps the, the legacy architecture, or your culture is about email and in-person meetings to run things, then 
you're, you're in a much tougher spot to make this transition. It's just going to be much more difficult to make the transition to re remote working. Yeah, I, certainly that's been a uh, made some companies nervous is that they may not have grown up in a work from anywhere type of culture. Right. And you can speed some things up. You know, you can deploy technologies that allow you to sort of work uh, in, in a remote fashion, but you can't accelerate uh, at, a, at least at any comfortable pace the, the cultural change aspect. So, you, you know, what probably could take a couple of years to roll out at a sort of balanced pace um, is now having to be done in sort of weeks. And mm -hmm. that's what, in fact, the technology, I'm finding technology organizations as a, as a, as a function are, are actually sort of reasonably comfortable working this way. But the HR organization that's used to onboarding people in a physical manner, that's used mm -hmm. to, um, you know, handling physical, you know, I-9 documents and things like that, that, like that. it's definitely some, a lot of challenges, challenges there. Um, Hector, what about over at Okta? What is, what's going on there in you that know, regard? I think we're all very lucky that we work for kind of almost sure. next generation companies that are basically cloud friendly, born in the cloud, uh, because I mean, we've never had a single server at Okta that was used for production, right? I mean, we've, we've always been kind of really supporting Okta remotely, right? Um, and so engineering actually has, we have a, a no meeting day on Thursdays. Um, and so most people actually work from home on, on, on Thursdays, but it's kind of a, a very different thing to work one day where you're not going to have meetings versus having to work all week with like a ton of meetings using Zoom um, yeah. and then communicating via Slack and accessing files via Box. It, it's definitely an adjustment. I think for engineering, it's not so much of um, a big, big change, but you're right. I mean, there's people like I don't want to say other other organizations or other inside of Okta, but yeah, where you would send them a, a Slack message and they would reply via email, you know, and, and that kind of, that has to change. So culturally, <laughs> I think it's part of the technology is there. And I think, again, yeah. we were very lucky that, you know, we have Okta connecting everything. We have Slack, we have Box, we have, we have Zoom. So the technology is there, but it is still an adjustment, you know, yeah. even, even when you have like, I don't know, 10 meetings in a day um, and you're moving to from room to room, maybe kind of going, uh, walking a little bit, that's actually good for you versus being sitting in a room um, like with 10 hours of, of Zoom conference, that's actually takes a toll on you. And so we have been asking people to just finish meetings like five minutes before the hour so that they can actually just walk around, you know, yeah. just like drink something or move um, because it does, it, it was definitely an adjustment, even for engineering that, I mean, we would used to work from home at least one day a, a week is different. And the cultural thing, you know, the, the cultural aspect of you have the technology, but you need to make sure that you train your, your users to, to use it. You know, even little things like, you know, how do you start a Zoom and how do you kind of customize your background um, and, and all of those things that are just important to make sure that people stay connected. Um, and we've been doing a lot of virtual kind of happy hours and virtual meetings, virtual yeah. hallway conversations, just so that people keep that kind of uh, people um, kind of engagement that you need. Um, and it's, it's funny how, how much you miss it after like two weeks of just solely yeah. working from home. Yeah, there's a, there's a, 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 a question that came in um, into the chat here around tip tips, hints, tips, and tricks. And so I think we'll, we'll definitely start to share some of those, those in a few here. You know, one of the things you talk about in sort of keeping people socially connected, um, you know, we've seen everything from people showing what they're making for lunch to oh, yeah. taking, taking meetings on their Peloton. I heard there's now a, we have a work from home hacks Slack channel and uh, people have shared how you can hack your Peloton to actually be, be, um, conduct a Zoom meeting on the Peloton oh, screen. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been using my, I've been using my oh, iPad cool. and iPhone, but uh, apparently you can hack the, the actual uh, um, Peloton. I don't know what that does to your warranty. Um, wow. uh, there's also, yeah, there's <laughs> lots of different, uh, different uh, things going on there. And Anisha, maybe, maybe you could share a little bit because you know, as Hector was talking about um, you know, moving from room to room, um, we have actually seen an increase in break fix requests 
Yeah. Uh, so maybe share a little yeah, bit about what, what's going on. sort of one of the uh, unintended consequences of this accelerated working from home. We definitely, to the point of, you know, having a physical supply chain, I think Steve mentioned this, uh, you know, one of the things you do have to think about is what do you do about break, fix and laptop re requests and onboarding people and how do you deal with that? And one of the interesting things we've seen is an increase in break, fix requests and lots of people being super apologetic. You know, I was helping my child and uh, drop the laptop and I had it on the coffee table and spilled coffee. And so, you know, we are trying to figure out how to, we are definitely seeing an increase in break, fix volume just because people have less than ideal setups at home, right? And there's just more opportunity to break things. And we are looking at how do we um, move more of that support entirely remote. And, you know, I think to the point that I think Gary made and Hector made and Steve made, you know, I think we're all fortunate that we we work for very digitally native companies and sort of the, the IT decisions around being cloud first and cloud native seem particularly prescient at this point in time in terms of, you know, supporting this, this moment and working, uh, working from home. And then you have to figure out some of these edge cases like break fix and how do you, how do you, you know, resolve that uh, going forward. It's yeah. Just, and I would, I would add on top of that. One of the challenges is right now is um, unless companies have built up sort of a, a surplus or an inventory of, of laptops or, or devices for the for your employees because we're still hiring new people right along yeah. you know we haven't right. stopped our hiring necessarily and so we still have to onboard um, and I know that a lot of companies uh, sort of have these dwindling inventories of, of laptops and are now struggling to actually uh, procure you know new inventory so you've got this sort of little bit of a double whammy of work work from home creating more a higher probability of laptops breaking and so on at the same time as dwindling or restricted access to, to inventory. So um, definitely <clears throat> a number of companies working through that. Yeah, even for so, some companies, like, like even for us, like the physicality of, of shipping laptops um, kind of becomes a problem. One, one thing that happened to us as well, even in development, we said, you know, we, we always work from home, we should be okay. But um, we found out that, well, we knew it, but there are some devices like mobile devices where we test our mobile app that, you know, they're not virtual. They were in the office. So we actually had to take those devices mm. out of the office and putting developers out so that you could actually can, can test like the physical device, yeah. the physical iPhone or yeah. physical Android. So even for companies like us, there's still some physicality that yes. you need to deal with. Yeah. Well, yeah. One, of the, one of the companies you're working with on the way out, when they told people, you know, you're not coming back to work on Monday, they told them to take their monitors. Yeah. Monitor. They, walked yeah. Out of, they walked out of the building with a monitor. And they said, take it home, right? And that was it. And, but I do appreciate what we said about the break fix because um, even in our own company, we're becoming tech support for every router in the world. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy, right? Oh, and, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, the, yeah. Fix, the fix my com Comcast. And, okay. and, and it's always been that people who have been even on these kind of sessions or in big meetings, like even large webinars with speakers are on Wi-Fi. And the Wi-Fi will stall at home because maybe the kid starts downloading, you know, a yeah. Netflix uh, high def movie. Right. Yeah. And all of a sudden dad's Zoom, you know, as he's presenting to his 30,000 employees, freezes and things yeah. like that are bombs. That no, it's, it's a good point. You know, I actually uh, I, I, I started using the, ter the term the, the, the box IT geek squad because we're actually yeah. feel like we're doing this B2C model of as we run into experiences like this, we're helping people tune their home network, you know, their ISP. You know, it's like, yes, you've got 50 video cameras and three other Zoom conferences going on and a bunch of Netflix streaming. It's like, yeah, you're going to have challenges. So those types of best practices are, are emerging as well, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, I, I will, quick funny story. I was actually on a, on a conference the other day, Zoom meeting the other morning, and my daughter came into my, my 16-year-old came into my office. Um, of course, no, 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 no comprehension that I might be already on a, uh, on a, on a zoom call. And she's like, dad, have you seen the charger for my laptop? I need to get on a zoom call for school. I'm like, Hey, welcome to the 200 people I'm on a zoom call with right now. You know, <laughs> the world we live in, but I'll share one other thing that I, that, that I, that I had a little bit of a blind spot to, um, early on that I've now closed. Um, and that is we talk a lot about sort of the people working from home and, and the home environments having, other distractions, you know, whether that's pets barking or kids running around or spouses working in the room next door. But we also have a, you know, a sizable population of, of employees that actually live alone. You know, they're single, they, they live in a, a single, you know, an apartment by themselves. And, you know, loneliness is a real, is a real thing, right? And we yeah. making sure that we're doing extra reach outs 
and yes. extra connecting with um, individuals that might be working that might be living alone at a time like this is is extra important as well. So just a, another tip that I picked up picked up along the way. Absolutely. Well, we've seen a lot of people do like um, happy hours. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Uh, me and my friends, we used to meet in New York, you know, for a glass of red wine. We decided that we moved those to Zoom. And every Wednesday yeah. night, 9 o'clock, bring your own, right? And so we've seen a lot of those. Uh, Zoom started doing open mics. We just start these big webinars, and anybody who works for Zoom can get on and just talk about anything that they yeah. want, just for some of the people who are single and at home. Yeah, cool. yeah, I think that's super important. The point about, well, we're using all these technologies to enable work for sure, but it is also a way to ensure, you know, checking in and ensure well-being and, and uh, also continuing to create community and culture, right? We've done that through Slack and all our fun channels. We, you know, we have the work from home lunch and who knew boxers were this creative about the lunches they make, but there's some, been some super creative things there, whether it's the remote work from home hacks channel, whether it's the virtual Paul's hosting a virtual bring your own beverage meeting today, in fact, to, to do exactly that, right? And so it's certainly an enabler, not just of work, but also of continuing to maintain community and culture, I think, at work. And yeah, what, what we did. People what are we getting did. super cool. creative. I got to tell you, I was on one call the other day at 11.30, Uber Eats. They sent me a voucher. I ordered and lunch came at the time lunch came for everybody else. It was actually pretty cool. Right. Yeah, I a, think Okta. Okta just. Creative, um, right. Yeah, I think Okta for your upcoming conference actually sent out something similar to uh, a conference attendees that there's a a, a Grubhub or something. Um, right. This uh, was a this was a conference yeah. actually. Right. Yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing Different. that we did is we did a virtual happy hour where it's like bring your own drink, but also we did a little bit of a contest with um, with Zoom, and we said okay, best background. And so people got that. super Ooh, creative, they had props, <laughs> and then we picked kind of the top 10, and then we actually did a poll on Slack, and so people could right. vote to see who, who, who was getting the award, and that was super fun, and it's, um, you know, it definitely helps, you know, get people connected, so we're planning Absolutely. on doing it probably awesome. every other week. Awesome. awesome. Well, uh, talking of super fun, let's transition to security and risk. Oh boy. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I'm sure this is something that uh, we've all experienced and are experiencing, especially our customers are experiencing this, is that responding to a crisis does not mean, you know, security threats um, are any less pervasive than, than they ordinarily are. In fact, uh, we've seen an uptick in COVID-19 malware attacks using bogus news articles, malicious emails, fake real-time COVID-19 maps, uh, things like that. And, and actually, we were just, as I mentioned earlier, looking at some statistics that we've gathered now over the last few weeks, and we have seen a significant increase in malware attacks um, and spamming, of course, everybody's spamming on their COVID-19 stuff. And uh, we're definitely seeing a huge rise in uh, sort of inbound email and a rise in emails that we're blocking. So this is where having services like sort of malware bytes, proof point, yep. you know, things like that are very important at times like this. And so it'd be interesting to know from the panelists, you know, anything you're doing differently or need to do anything that is different in regards to security and risk. Um, you know, we obviously, all of our companies maintain a very high bar for security and risk posture. And to the, to the point earlier where we talked about companies moving very quickly, I think that if, if as companies deploy or look to modernize their architecture to allow this work from home environment, if you don't th think through the architecture correctly, uh, then you know you can create actually a lot of holes in your environment. Um, and actually, it was interesting, Hector. You know, when you're talking about multi-factor authentication, yeah. you know, Stephen, it's a good example of where, you know, as companies roll out Slack and Box. You know, it's we we highly recommend, almost make it mandatory that they should turn on the native integration between the two services, so that you maintain security integrity with who has access to what across those two services. This, this is where the best of breed and the interoperability of our architecture really starts to, you know, um, pay off because you know you're you're at the same time as in enabling quickly, you're not creating as you know these security risks. So, um, anybody want to take a run at what, we're, what, what each of you are doing there? 
Well, maybe start with Hector. Yeah. Yeah, certainly multi-factor authentication. Um, we're actually, uh, I think we, we even have kind of a, um, a page where, you know, any company that wants to enable right now multi-factor authentication and Okta can do it for free. Um, because we, we do believe that multi-factor authentication is going to be super important right now during these times. As you're saying, we're seeing way more phishing attacks and people taking advantage of this situation. And, you know, multi-factor authentication, and if you train your users to use it properly and you have your, your good, good um, policies, it's pretty effective. It's pretty effective, um, especially in these times where, you know, we have um, a feature called Thread Insights that is just looking at your IP addresses and where you're coming from and where you're not coming from. Even in these times, you know, the machine learning, it's going to automatically learn what your IP address is for your house, and it's going to know that it just, it, it's, it's a good kind of low-risk uh, attempt versus all of these attempts that we're seeing from random IP addresses all over the world. So, I mean, our recommendation is definitely multi-factor authentication, definitely having a, um, a policies where you can have multiple of these and um, to, to, to just to improve at least the authentication to these services. Um, yeah. yeah, and I would agree with that from, from a Slack perspective. I, I don't think we're doing anything differently. I just think there's, based on the uh, increased uh, phishing attacks and security potential threats, um, there's, there's more uh, scrutiny around, you know, what's going on right now. So, so I think about um, our security and, and risk organization really using um, Slack to effectively keep abreast of, of all the things that are going on, all the potential threats that we have. Um, being able to respond to those quickly, sort of spin up Zoom meetings from Slack, again, coming back to the integrations, if they need to get in a war room to be able to address that. Um, so the integrations have become really important. Um, you know, we think about the sort of levels of security we have in the product itself. It really doesn't vary uh, based on the, the free plan that we're pushing out there. It has the same level of enterprise grade security. Uh, we do have advanced features when it comes into uh, you know, enterprise key management and things of that nature to help with data protection, identity and device management and those types of things. So, so I don't think it's anything particularly different based on the architecture that we have in play today. It's just more um, sort of agile and uh, focus, I would say, on, on the risk that's going on right now. Yeah, Anisha, what about yeah, Anisha? Would, yeah, from a box perspective, I think two things. From a customer facing perspective, we want to make sure customers are aware of all the security capabilities in the product and using them to its full advantage, right? Yep. Things like Shield that are available to really secure your content. And, and the thing that Paul mentioned, which is architecting these best of breed solutions with leveraging the native integration so you're using them appropriately. So you have chain of control and custody uh, at, for your content, for example, at all times, no matter where you're surfacing it or using it. I think from an employee perspective, the other thing we're really focused on is, uh, to Steve's point, it's not anything different or new, but heightened awareness, right? So we're continuing to make sure our employees stay diligent, we're communicating, um, the fact that we are seeing an increase in phishing attacks. And then obviously you have the underlying sort of technology underpinnings to catch a lot of these things that we continue to employ. But I think communicating um, this um, both to customers and employees has been a pretty important thing for us as well. Yeah, you know, I think I got to parrot what you said also about teaching our, especially our clients, all the security yeah. tools that are built into yeah. our products, because yeah. most of the time they don't use them. At, yeah. the end, yeah. at the end of the day, you know, they'll, they'll, especially when they're inside the four walls, right? They tend to not think about things like, why do I need a password on my Zoom call, right? Why can't yeah. I use the same Zoom number and get, why would I get a random number and things yeah. like that? Um, I also think that as I'm working with a lot of companies, ours included, is you can't stop training your employees just because they're home. Yeah. And that phishing test still need to go on. And, you know, I know everybody backed off in the first week because they didn't want to give employees like trainings and things like that, but they are a little bit on their own. Um, and so they still need the trainings and the current environment has changed. Uh, being a prior CISO also the, the, the current uh, way that, that hackers are looking at, at employees working from home is, has greatly changed the landscape. Yeah. And so it's, it's not even a matter about the training you gave them last two, six weeks ago, that training needs to be revamped. Right. And now you need to go out to them and you need to let them know the world has kind of changed. And I think also we're, we're probably seeing a, a mix of people who are now doing business on their personal devices. Like, yeah, they could be on a Zoom call, but they could be using their regular cellular SMS to chat to someone rather than than using something built into the tool, which is a lot more secure because they're, you know, that that whole multitasking world word gets in there. And so I think, you know, just training them. The common sense is where it comes from first, but, but training them on the new threats and how to use the products we put out there in the best possible way. Which yeah, it's, a great, it, it's a really great point. I mean, we've, 
you know, there, there's a compounding effect of just additional stressors that are going on in people's environments anyway, right? The concern over COVID, the concern over, you know, what's going on with, in the family environment, you know, th there's lots and lots of stressors that are, that are on top of, you know, piling in on top. And then it's an opportunity for, for the, the, the bad actors to find ways to exploit. Um, it definitely uh, keeping the organization uh, alert and aware educated we've been doing the same things gary you know as part of our formal communication we have you know a consistent message around sort of where you can go for the faq and and also the the things to be aware of um, when it comes to you know bad actors and and we haven't stopped our own internally you know, we have our own red team that does phishing attacks on the only thing we did is we we didn't um you we didn't use um COVID-19 as a, as a phishing attack ourselves. We felt that that was definitely yeah, probably that's not- That's too low, that's too low. <laughs> that's too low, yeah, I, I said that. I said that's kind of a low blow, let's not yeah. go there. Um, but we, but tax season is upon us. Maybe that's when we, yeah. you know, yeah. we can, we can use so. Or just work, uh, work from home tips, right? That's always yep, good. We have that as well, yep. Work from yep. home so tips, a, is, everyone's clicking on that. We have you know, a good, I think yep. I do believe it, it's also an opportunity as IT professionals um, for us to actually look at the settings of all of these collaboration tools that we use mm. and ensure that they are secure by default. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, definitely not uh, any of the companies that, that we're talking here, but there are other services that are insecure by default. And you need yeah. to basically look at really all of the settings to make sure that by default, you're not allowing, I don't yes. know, external people accessing your files or external people connecting to yeah. your, to your yes. To your conversations because that we've seen that and and we have to take special care right now um about those settings because there are there, is, there are ways to make it secure by default but not all companies uh, choose to do yeah. that yeah. it's a great point and this is what i was mentioning earlier it's like if you're going to turn on turn on slack then turn on slack with with the integrate and box turn it on with the native integrations Correct. because right. the security mm -hmm. the security handshake is there between the two the two mm -hmm. services it's those it's sort of like the architecture led part of the conversation not just mm -hmm. turning on services right exactly so well, no, the problem very, is yeah. the, the it organizations who have newly adopted some of our technologies they pushed it out before they really understood it you know the, there yeah. was no poc anymore mm -hmm. it was hey i need this let's get it out there and the proof yep. of concept is in the production right now and yep. so they didn't really learn how to use our product securely yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, that was my point. I think it's definitely the speed now has created potential security risk. So, um, so a couple of things, I know we, we're getting, sort of getting closer to the end of our time. So one of the other questions that came in here uh, was in, in terms of talking to other CIOs, other, other customers um, that you've spoken to, either, either big or small, um, which ones are, are doing remote uh, work well? And have you learned sort of any key takeaways that other companies are, are um, that was one of the questions that somebody asked. So anybody want to take a run at that? We had a large webinar the other day and, and I asked one of the polling questions about um, how many people are working remote right now? Uh, 96%. How many mm. people, these are CIOs, how many people felt they were prepared to move to remote workers uh, yeah. over 90%. I kind of challenge that because yeah. a lot of people clicked yes to that. A lot of people felt that they were ready for this. I just don't- Feeling think. prepared. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I don't, I don't, I don't. And I also said from, from, it was all CIOs and you mentioned CIOs. From the CIO yeah. perspective, I think they think they were prepared. But if we asked, had asked that question to the end users, yeah. I don't know if we would have got the same answer. Yeah. Yeah, and we, the, the interesting thing from, from our perspective when I talk to our, our customers is the ones that I think have made the transition successfully um, are, are you know, thankful that they have a, an architecture that they can rely on to, to make that transition. But even where they've had challenges around that, it's trying to, as much as possible, humanize the whole experience. So it comes back to the kind of cultural aspect again. How, how do you actually replace that sense of connectedness when everyone's in a in a separate location. So I'll give you an example as a, a leading uh, game developer. Um, uh, there's about 4,000 employees uh, that shall remain nameless, but their CEOs and their execs are sharing daily updates and they're doing through, through this through Slack. They've created channels, not only around you know, COVID, but also you know, tips and tricks around working from home and uh, you know, parents' channels. They've got the, the kind of water cooler channels going on for people to try and recreate that sense of, of connectedness that might be missing right now. 
One of the things we've seen in some of the other customers, though, this is this is pretty natural, is um, because there's not that physical connectedness that you get in the, in the office. We're finding, of course, that people are using Zoom much more, but that creates a challenge in and of itself because you have to schedule time with people and all of a sudden you find yourself on 10 hours of Zoom meetings on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to do is advise people to kind of back off those non-essential meetings. I think that the virtual happy hours are great uh, and those kind of drop-in connected, more social types of things. But as much as you can do, um, in kind of a, a synchronous but disconnected fashion where you don't have to actually see the person have a physical conversation through Slack channels, through using Box, through the, using the tools that are available to you. I think it becomes a much more efficient and effective way of working as people start to set into this kind of new norm. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good point. I, for some reason, it just feels like uh, my days are really, 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 really long. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm sat in front of my screen more than I ever was before. And I have to be right. conscientious myself of breaking free of that. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, I, I got up yesterday. And I'm like, oh, my butt is dead. I'm not used to sitting oh, down exactly. this, this amount exactly. of time, right? Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. What well, a question. Um, it, it, in, it, this has come up before in some of the conversations I've had around. Um, because we move so quickly, um, I think, Gary, you mentioned uh, taking monitors home. And I've heard... You know, like it, like it box. They're all on arms. You need screwdrivers, and it does that doesn't really work too well. And you know, I actually use um, Sidecar, so I uh, for which comes with the the new Mac OS. So I actually have my my iPad is actually my second monitor. Uh, lots of sort of work from home hacks like that. A lot of companies are talking about or have um, or providing a stipend for people to be able to work from home. Is that something that you've adopted at, at your respective companies? And we're not talking thousands of dollars, you know, we're talking, you know, a few hundred dollars permission to go spend an expense to, to get some of the more sort of needed work from home peripherals or so on. Is that something that, that, you, that your companies are doing? At Zoom, I know I, I'm probably the newest employee. I started like six months ago and I got a whole work at home kit. So as soon as you become an employee, you get a whole work at home kit includes camera, keyboard, everything you need to work at home. So for our point, uh, everyone gets one of those. So it, it actually works out really well um, to work from home. But, you know, but, we, but, it, but it is part of the fabric. But, but if I'm one second, yeah. you're absolutely right. I worked with a company the other day and they were thinking of like a $500 stipend or things like that. You know, yeah. the executive yeah. levels that we normally deal with, they just send equipment home to them, right? But at yeah. the employee level, they're thinking of a stipend. Yeah. yeah, and we, we provide kind of a work from home sort of basic setup as well, webcams and things of that nature. What, what we found though is we uh, you know, spend 10 hours a day on meetings at home. You want to make the physical environment for the employee, which is the other consideration, as comfortable as possible. So we have actually offered up a $500 stipend for people to you know, buy a desk, sit stand desk, or whatever makes them comfortable, a nice chair um, with their physical environment, as well as making sure they have the technology that they need. Yeah, yeah, similarly so at Box, I mean, we, we did decided to do a stipend as well. And it was, it, the, the needs are varied, right? Some people need a desk or a proper chair. Some people, mm -hmm. depending on the work they do, really wanted a bigger monitor than trying to look, look at a laptop screen. So we've done something similar just to make sure people are set up for being able to work from home for a protracted period of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, the, the, the reality is that we do have offices, but you know, I think we're all open to having people work from, from home and, and remote employees. So we, we were kind of in the middle of kind of trying to support more the dynamic work environment where, you know, by default, people are going to be working from home. But during these times, yeah, I mean, you, you can expense your monitor and, and, and we'll pay for it. That's fine at Okta. Um, but one, one interesting thing is that there's different setups between, between different teams because obviously the technical operations team, uh, they are used to like having three monitors and the super expensive right. keyboard mm -hmm. and nice ergonomic mouse. So we're basically also kind of prioritize whatever the, the technical operations team um, needs, um, including even um, kind of machines or, or, or anything that they need just to be productive in during these times as if they were in the office. Yeah, and I think it's a, this is certainly something that's come up as part of a number of the conversations I've had. When we say at these times, we don't know how long this is actually yep. going to go on for, right? This could be weeks, this could be months, this could be weeks, and then there's a break and then we have to go back to this situation again. Um, and how prepared are we? What have we learned and so on from, from each of these, you know, from, during this period. And, you know, to your point, these, we shouldn't be looking at short-term Band-Aid um, investments here. These need to be, I, I've known some, you know, I've been talking to some CIOs that have said, look, 
something that's really important to them right now is that you know vendors or partners are actually being real partners you know we're not this isn't an opportunity to to hold people to ransom or to sell more this is really about look we're all in this together um and we're all you know we're all we're all um looking for the the you know, mutually beneficial outcome here and the the interesting thing is is there are some services that i've heard none of none of them on this call right now but that have been that have been having some stability issues and we have to be able to trust in these services at times like this mm -hmm. and you know when the dust settles you know some of them are saying look we're, we're we're considering moving away from this service because it just wasn't reliable enough for us during this period of time we've actually uh, been in pretty good shape ourselves at box but one thing i know uh, anisha um, you know we've been doing is actually looking at all of our service providers and making sure that they are going to be financially viable through this period, which could go on for some period of time, right? There's a lot of things we have to do about sort of looking into the future. So any, any, any inputs on that, Nisha, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you, you said it well. I mean, this is looking not just in the immediate term, but in, in the mid or long term, you know, we just, we recognize, I mean, you just look at the unemployment numbers, right? The graph looks ridiculous today. It went from like an average of 395 K unemployment claims to like 3.5 million in, in a week. Um, so you're going to see an economic fallout out of that. And one of the things we want to make sure is we do have a best of breed, you know, our architecture, we use a lot of service providers in, our, especially in our business systems environment. We want to make sure we understand um, their viability, their stability, you know, technically knock on wood, we haven't had issues, but just want to make sure. So we are doing an assessment and just making sure we, um, we double click on on um, any provider or vendor um you know if they tend to be on the smaller side or you know we we, we don't um it, we don't know enough uh, about them at this point so we, we're definitely doing that right now yeah from our from our side uh we use a lot of services just to keep kind of the service running you know we have monitoring services we have uh kind of global monitoring stuff that that is basically additional services that we use um, we try to have at least two providers for everything. So um, we're kind of like, um, at least we, we have kind of backup providers for everything, but that's basically for, for our core service. For everything else that the company is using, yeah, we're going through that analysis of like what companies uh, could be in trouble, you know, because there's an, a lot of services that we use, especially as a cloud-friendly company. I mean, you know, we, we all have like hundreds of applications that people are using mm -hmm. just to keep the service running. Not, not the service service, but the actual business running. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. applications that are connecting, I don't know, Marketo to NetSuite or NetSuite to yep. whatever. And, and all, of those, all of those services, we, we're basically looking at how to look at, at that to make sure that, that we're ready. But um, again, we, we put that in two buckets, the, the services that we need to keep the Okta service running in one bucket and then everything else to run the business. And we're looking yeah. at that. Yeah. It's scary times. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. We, need to, we need to look across because look, some of this might be the new norm. Yep. Right. I mean, right. I don't think we're just going to get to one day where we say everybody go back to work and everybody's going to say, I'm going back. A lot of the jobs that, that are now at home could stay home and probably mm -hmm. will stay home. Right. Yeah. And so the new norm means will, will the, the vendors we deal with and, and uh, continue through that new norm. Yeah. And, and I, I think, I think ultimately there's, there's going to be goodness that comes out of this as well. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's an incredibly challenging situation that we've been forced into in like a really short time frame. And I think managing risk and looking at your vendors and partners. Uh, but I think the goodness will be around how we actually improve the way we work in the future. I always go back to the, the ride sharing analogy. So if you're in a city that has a ride sharing service like Uber or Lyft, it's likely never in your life are you going to go back and call a, a cab company on the telephone and verbally tell them your address and then wait an indeterminate amount of time until they come to your place and then ultimately pay them cash at the end of the ride, right? There just becomes a point where it's so much more convenient to use the ride share app on your phone. And I think ultimately that's what's going to happen at the end of this. We'll, we'll take some of the techniques and the tools that we've learned from working remotely and then apply them to improving the way we work going forward, even when we go back to our corporate offices, regardless of where you work. And, yeah. and those beliefs that we can't be productive at home, we're proving now. People oh, yeah. Productive at home, right? You know, the part about you can't be secure at home. Well, you know, we're, we're proving we can be secure at home too and things like that. But uh, we did a session the day about working great from home and, mm -hmm. and people have actually figured out ways to retool their jobs to be remote. 
in a very short period of time as well. In a very short period, out of necessity, yeah. right? So yeah. they've retooled the way they do things, and 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 some of the rules have relaxed. Like even even here in the United States, you can now sign some documents um, over different transports and things like that, which you couldn't do before, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right? Because there was some rule that said you couldn't do it. Uh, was it isn't it the first time? Is it the Senate or the House that's going to vote video or vote audio for the first time? Mm -hmm. Things like that. So there's yeah. rules. And we're challenging now, and so mm -hmm. I agree. Um, we are changing for the better, right? Yeah. Uh, reason we're basically, really but we are changing for the better. Basically, yeah, never it'll, getting back to normal because the normal is going to change. The normal is yeah, going to change. That's right. It'll, that's right. It'll, yeah, it'll definitely accelerate more digital, you know, absolutely uh, digital experiences because getting a wet signature in an environment like this is really hard. Right. Um, you know, so yeah, social distancing is a lot harder to do when you have to give someone a piece of paper and a pen and say, mm -hmm. please sign this, right? Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this, has been, this has been great. I mean, I really appreciate the, 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 the wisdom and the insights and perspectives shared by, by the group here. Um, you know, I, I'm always been a big believer in the wisdom of our technology community and anytime we, we can bring leaders together, it's a great opportunity for us all to, to learn and share and collaborate with one another. So I wanted to thank our executive panel panelists today for sharing their perspectives, valuable insights. Um, I know, especially at times like this, it's very much appreciated because I know we're all super busy making sure that our organizations are running and, and so on. So hopefully the audience will find some nuggets of value in this conversation. So thank you for joining today. Be safe, everyone. And uh, we'll be back soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.